Uh, let's pray to God, shall we? Lord God, as we uh, look at your word right now, we want to be people that desire to uh, read your word, but also be changed by your word, to be transformed, to be those that are obedient to your commands to us and willing to let you uh, be in control of our lives, to be Lord of our lives. Father, help us to have an openness, help us to have a humility within ourselves as we look at your word this morning. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Jesus is alive. With many convincing proofs, he showed himself to the apostles over a period of 40 days after he was raised from the dead. He proved that he, in fact, was conqueror over death. The gospel, in a nutshell, is that Jesus Christ humbled himself, he became a human being, and he offered his life as a sacrifice for our sins, according to scriptures. He was buried, and then on the third day he rose from the, the grave, according to scriptures, never to die again. And because of this, every one of us who put our faith in Jesus Christ, everyone who are willing to follow Jesus Christ as Lord of their lives, have this absolute assurance, this hope of eternal life in glory. We're finishing off our, series, uh, our sermon series in the book of Matthew this morning. Matthew doesn't record all of the uh, appearances of Jesus after his resurrection, but he does give us one very key one that talks to the mission of the church, the mission of those who are in Christ Jesus. So I want you to please at this time turn with me to our text. It's Matthew chapter 28, and we're going to read verse 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Before we get right into the text, I'd like us to take a moment and think about some of these uh, 11 uh, disciples. Some of them when Jesus first called them to follow him. You might remember in your mind's eye, Jesus walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And as he's walking along, he sees two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea because they were fishermen. And he calls out to them and says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. To be a disciple is to follow. To be a disciple of Jesus is to follow Jesus. That is, to learn from Jesus, to imitate Jesus, to become like Jesus. And what did Jesus tell these first disciples as he went along the sea and as he called them to follow him? He used an illustration to say what he expected of those who would follow him. And it makes sense that his illustration fit with their particular job set. They were fishermen, and so he says, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Come, be my disciples, and I will teach you to be disciple makers. Now, after three years of ministry, after Jesus' death and resurrection, the expectation has not changed. What did Jesus tell these men in Matthew 28? He said, go make disciples, be fishers of men. This is Jesus' final command in the book of Matthew. And it's an imperative. The imperative here is make disciples. Jesus had proved his authority to make such a command. During his lifetime, he had proved his authority. The, the crowds, when they heard him speak and when he, they heard him teach, they said, well, this man teaches as one who has authority, even greater authority than our scribes and our Pharisees. He proved his authority to heal people. He proved his authority over the demons. He proved that he even had the authority to forgive sins. And now there is absolutely no doubt, having been raised from the dead, that all authority in heaven and earth is, in fact, given to Jesus. This is important to understand. This command comes from the one who has all authority. It is an important command for us to follow. When Jesus' disciples saw him on the mountain, that mountain in Galilee, the text tells us that they worshipped him. 
but then some doubted. Some scholars have suggested that the doubt was not really the 11, that maybe there were some other people there and they hadn't seen Jesus raised from the dead yet, and so that they were almost in disbelief. And that may be the case, or it may be that some of the disciples still have some, like, almost, I can hardly believe my eyes kind of situation. But let me suggest another perspective for a moment. Uh, the word that's used here for doubt is ditsazo. It's only found one other place in the New Testament. And we're probably familiar with the story. The story is when the disciples were out on the Sea of Galilee. They're in a boat. It's night. And they're fighting the winds and the waves. And as they're fighting the winds and the waves in the darkness of night, they see Jesus coming to them walking on the water. And of course, they're naturally afraid. But Jesus cries out to them, and he says to them, Take heart in his eye, do not be afraid. You probably remember what happens next, right? Peter says, Well, Lord, if it's really you, command me to come to you on the water. So does Jesus command him? Yeah, he commands him. He says, Come. What happens next is an amazing thing. Peter, he gets out of the boat and he walks on the water. From Matthew's account in chapter 14, verse 29, we see that he comes to Jesus walking on the water. But then another amazing thing takes place. Peter saw the wind and he started to be afraid and he started to sink. He does know who to call out to. Lord, save me! And certainly Jesus reaches out and he saves him. But Jesus' next words may be somewhat instructive to our present context as well. He says, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? What is it that Peter doubted? He had gotten out of the boat, he'd walked on the water. What is it that he's doubting? It seems that he started to sink when he took his eyes off Jesus. When he started to recognize, hey, wait a minute, I'm out here in the middle of a storm, walking on the water, I can't do this, I can't walk on water, I'm gonna drown. He starts to look at his own insecurities, what he is or is not capable of doing in and of himself and forgetting that his trust is in Jesus Christ. It seems that his doubts arose from something that was within himself, his own insecurities. Back to our present text, Matthew 28, verse 17. They saw him, some doubted. They had come to Jesus, not walking on the water, but they had come to him according to his command to meet him on a particular mountain in Galilee. And here they are. But some are doubting. And maybe some of that doubt is really the fact, not so much that Jesus is right in front of them and they can see him and, oh, I can't believe it, but more like insecurities within themselves. Well, what does this mean? What's going to happen? I don't know what the future holds. What I thought the future hold is not what the future holds. And now Jesus is risen from the dead. What, what, what's next? I don't know. I'm unsure. I'm insecure. You know, often when the preacher gets up and he, I've noticed this at least in talking with people that preacher gets up and he preaches a sermon on disciple-making or evangelism. And a large percentage of those who are listening to the sermon think, oh yeah, that's a, that's a nice sermon, that's important. But I think that was really a job for the apostles. They were the ones that were supposed to be making disciples. Or they think in terms of, well, you know, some people have different gifts and some people's gift is making disciples, but that's not me. It's true that we have different gifts. But the analogy is also made that as we each have different gifts, that we're all one body. We all have one purpose. We all have one mission. And the one mission of the church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. It seems that some of the 11 doubted. A doubt that probably has root in their own uncertainties, their own fears within themselves. But that doesn't stop Jesus from giving them a command, his final command, as it were. So was that command just for the 11 on that mountain? Or was it just for the apostles? Or is that command actually for all disciples, even for you and I today, to make disciples? From the text itself, there's two facts that clearly state that really, this is not just for them, it's for us as well. 
The first fact is this, that as you're making disciples, one of the things that you're doing is you're teaching uh, them to obey everything that I have commanded you, Jesus said. Wait a sec. Everything that Jesus commanded them, and part of what he commanded them was to make disciples. And so those who would come to put their faith in Jesus Christ, be baptized in him as part of the discipleship process, they would be expected to do the same, that they would follow the commands of Jesus. And one of the commands is, in fact, to make disciples. Second fact is that Jesus assures his disciples, that those 11 on the mountain with him at that time, he assures them that he will be with them always. But he doesn't just say, I'll be with you always as long as you guys are alive. He says, I'll be with you always to the end of the age. This is pointing to the fact that this is not just about the disciples who were alive then. This is about the disciples who are alive even today. That we have a mission that Jesus gave and he emphasized the importance of that mission by saying, all authority in heaven and earth came from me. This is my command for you. This is really important. This is of utmost importance. You are to make disciples. You see, disciples of Jesus, if you're a disciple of Jesus, what's natural is you make disciples of Jesus. So if you're a disciple of Jesus, I'm a disciple of Jesus, wouldn't we not say to ourselves, well, I'm a disciple of Jesus. Therefore, it is my mission to make disciples of Jesus. It's who we are. It was the expectation of Jesus for those first disciples who followed him. They would become fishers of men. They would learn to make disciples. And now Jesus leaves them and us with the same command. Be disciple makers. Be disciple makers. It's who we are as believers in Christ Jesus. So what's involved in obeying Jesus' command to make disciples? Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples. Go. Oftentimes people think, well, you know, I'm not a missionary. I, I, you know, I can't, I'm not, you know, that's for some people. But then if, if disciple making is what every disciple is about, then going must not necessarily mean that we all have to go and leave our home country and go to some other country, does it? It seems to me that going is not just so much about going somewhere else, but it's as we go. I'm by no means a Greek scholar, but when I was taking my third or fourth class in New Testament Greek, this passage of Scripture was a text we studied, and it gave me a lot of enlightenment as, we, as I understood uh, the Greek. One of the things that we were taught to aid us in understanding and interpreting Scripture was to practice something called grammatical diagramming. It's where you take a sentence and you pick it apart and you realize what's the main verb and the things that are subject to the very thing, the things that are main within the sentence. So an example, in this particular sentence, it talks about the main verb. The main verb is make disciples. It's the imperative. That's the kind of verb it is, which means it's a command to make disciples. But then as we look at the English text, we say, well, what about the other verbs that seem to be there? We've got go, and we've got baptize, and we've got teach. What about those verbs? In the Greek, those are participles. Participles. In simple English, we might say, if you're not familiar with grammar, a participle is ending in ing. So in other words, going, baptizing, teaching. And all those participles are subject to and underneath the main verb, which is to make disciples. So yes, we should be on a mission that would mean we would go to other nations, some of us. But whoever we are, in the more general sense, as we're going, a participle, as we're going, we are to make disciples. As we're going about our daily routines, we are to make disciples. I often think about, or uh, maybe you have too, Jesus, he's traveling around a lot, it seems. But he spent most of his ministry in a relatively small geographical area, an area that was close to his home. He had made his home as, in his adult life at, at Capernaum, and it was in around this area that he did most of his teaching and his healing as he was ministering. In fact, when I was, uh, had vis visited the Holy Land with my father and in uh, 2013, I was amazed at just how close everything was together. 
We had stayed at a place uh, at Gennesaret, which is about halfway up the Sea of Galilee on the west side. And we had left one morning and we went and took about a 15 minute bus ride, meandering slowly up to the north shore of uh, the Sea of Galilee to Capernaum. And we spent a little bit of time there and then we got in the bus again and went for a short drive, very short drive, maybe three, four, five minutes at the most, to Bethsaida. And we're looking around. And as I'm in Bethsaida, I'm looking across, and it's like, it just seems like it's only a few fields away, and I can see Capernaum right there. We were just over there. I could probably walk there in within, within an hour. This whole area in which Jesus seemed to do most of his miracles, most of his healings, was within an area which probably within what we would say the city limits of Branton today. No problem. So was Jesus focused as he made disciples, as he was going about his business, was it to those crowds in that area? Was it to those who were healed, to those who were freed from demons? Certainly Jesus had followers that would come from that group. But wasn't it also true, though, that he spent most of his time, his concentration on a smaller group? We call them the, the Twelve or the Apostles. Certainly Jesus interacted with the crowd. He had compassion on the crowd. He taught the crowds, but he lived day in and day out with these few men. And he shared more fully and, and instructed them more fully and explained to things, things to them more fully in this smaller group. He would teach them to make disciples who would make disciples who would make disciples. Seems to me that this is Jesus' method of making disciples. Maybe it should be our method of making disciples as well. This idea of equipping and investing in a few people at a time so that they could come to know more fully Jesus Christ as Lord. As you're going about your daily routine, can you say this? That, yeah, yeah, that's what I want to do. That's the commitment that I want to make in my life, that I need to make in my life, that I will make in my life, that I will invest in a few people with the expressed purpose of making disciples of Jesus. For some of us, it doesn't, seem, it doesn't have to be something that seems really scary and foreign. If you're a parent and you have children, you have some discipling to do. Do those children come to know Jesus Christ because of the way that you live your life? That when there's things that are happening in life, that there's a distress in your life, the first place you go is to call, call on God, and they see that, and they pray with you, and they learn the Word of God with you. They see that lived out in your life, that you are a light to those children, that they come to know Jesus Christ through you. That's discipling. That's disciple-making. We do that with our friends. We have colleagues that we work with day in and day out on a daily basis. Like, it's what we do. We live with these people. So are we discipling these people that we live with every day? Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of, what is it? What's the next part? All nations. So we're not limited to our, our colleagues, our friends, our, our children. We even disciple within the church, right? We disciple one another. That's part of this make disciples thing. But we're not limited to the people that are, have the same background as us. We're not limited to the people that have the same skin color as us. We're not limited to those who think the same way that we think. It's incredible to me, incredible to me that and we've really come face to face with this in the last little period, this short period of time, that there's still some hearts that are deeply caught up in a hatred, a racism. See, God didn't actually make us all the same. That was God's design to make us different from each other, for there to be diversity. And yet in that, we are also the same because we're all made in God's image. No matter what we happen to look like on the outside, no matter what background we might have, we're all made in the image of God. We're all meant to have a relationship with God to be one in Christ Jesus. So we may choose to disciple uh, the people around us, we make a choice. Jesus made a choice about those 12. He spent the night in prayer at, before he chose those 12 apostles. So we do make choices. 
And it makes sense that sometimes those choices will be based on how we live our life, the routine of our life. We have certain people in our life on a regular basis, and those are the people we can spend time with. Those are the people that we ought to be making into disciples of Jesus Christ. But we also need to be careful not to limit ourselves to just people that think like us or look like us or whatever. Recognize that God doesn't want anyone to perish, but for everyone to come to repentance, to have life. This idea of repentance is very closely associated with the idea of baptism. To paraphrase, Jesus says, as you're going about your daily routine of life, I want you to make disciples. And part of making disciples is this, that you baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. See, disciple-making involves baptizing people. Jesus once told a religious leader that unless a person is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Paul said in Romans chapter 6 that this idea of baptism, everyone who believes in Christ Jesus, that we've been baptized in Christ Jesus, and what that means is that we put to death the old person. There's this repentance that takes place. That we're saying that old person of sin is now put to death. And now I live a new life raised with Christ Jesus through baptism to live in order to glorify God. Acts 2.38, we're very familiar with as people in the Church of Christ. It says those people that are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, they're baptized for the forgiveness of their sins that they may receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 3.27 tells us that those baptized in Christ Jesus have put on Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is in us, and, and He works through us who put our faith in Jesus Christ. It's that point where we make that commitment that Jesus Christ will be and is Lord of my life. Notice in Matthew's account, a person is baptized into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Uh, interesting thing to note in the Greek, the word, the the word that we have here for name is singular. This points to the unity of God. There's three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but there's one name. They are one. There's a unity there. And although I think I've been probably in the habit, as I remember back, I don't think I, I think, I, there may have been one or two times when I did not do this, but usually the phraseology I use when I'm baptizing somebody, I say, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And that would certainly be right to do. But in the book of Acts, over and over again, we see the example of in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Familiar passage again, Acts 2.38. It says, in the name of Jesus. Those who are baptized in Jesus' name... And so this point seems to say that, you know, those who are joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we are not just born again in Christ Jesus. We put on Christ Jesus. We are one with Christ Jesus. But we are one with Christ Jesus just as much as Jesus Christ is one with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. And so the Spirit and the Son and the Father are alive in us. These three persons but they're one. Of course, a person who is going to be baptized needs to understand why they're being baptized. You don't just get baptized because, well, uh, I have no idea what it's about, but it seems like a good idea. A person needs to understand that, hey, I have a sin problem. There is a need that I have in my life that without, because of my own inabilities, my own weaknesses, I am separated from God. I have to understand that first. And then I also have to understand that, well, there's nothing that I can do that about that in myself. No matter what I, can do, what I do, there's still going to be um, imperfections in my life. I'll never be perfect. I'll never be good enough. But we realize that in Christ Jesus, it's not about us being good enough. It's about us surrendering our lives to what God has done in Christ Jesus. It's by grace we're saved, and we put our faith in what God has done through Jesus Christ. And so when we understand that, those, those, uh, those teachings, we have to understand the teaching of that, then we make the, we're able to make a decision to say, yes, I want to make Jesus Christ Lord of my life. 
I want to live for him. I recognize it's not about me and what I am capable of doing. It's what he can do in me if I surrender to him. So it's the beginning point. But as we are taught that what baptism is all about and this need for commitment, this idea of the process of disciple making, it's not just done when we get baptized. Disciple making is an, a lifelong process. Disciple making involves teaching people to obey all the commands of Jesus Christ. As I've mentioned several times before, uh, we don't study the Bible just to know a bunch of biblical facts, just to get some knowledge. We study the Bible to be changed, to be transformed in the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to become like Him. This is a sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit within us who have been baptized in Christ Jesus. When we're baptized in Christ Jesus, we receive the Spirit of Christ Jesus, the Spirit of God. And God works in us. But as disciples of Christ, whose mission it is to be disciple makers, God wants to use us in that process. God's plan is not to just directly tell everybody what they need to do and, and force people into his kingdom. He uses people. He uses those who make the commitment to Christ Jesus as Lord of their life. He uses you. He uses me to make disciples of Jesus Christ. We disciple one another. We learn together. We put into practice the commands of Christ. We encourage one another. We help one another. We love one another. We build one another up. That's disciple making. But church, that's not all of disciple making. We're not the only ones that Jesus came to save, those who are already in the church. If that was the case, well, I guess the church wouldn't have started in the first place because he was done when he got finished with the apostles? No. He commissioned them to make disciples, and they did. He later commissions them to, to, to keep going, like to start in Jerusalem and then go to Judea and Samaria and to, to the ends of the earth. The point is that everybody, everyone, everywhere needs the gospel message of Jesus Christ, not just those who are already in the church. So though disciple-making, part of disciple-making is certainly that we build one another up, that we mature each other, help each other grow in Christ Jesus to become more like our Savior. It's just as vital, just as important that people who are outside of Christ, maybe even more important, what, didn't Jesus leave the 99 on the hill and go after the one? Even more important for those who are not in the flock, who are not in the fold to come to Christ Jesus the mission of the church is to make disciples. Going, baptizing, teaching. So if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, well, the question is, are you on mission? Are you about the mission? Is that what you live for day to day, recognizing as I go to work or as I go to school or as I do whatever I'm doing, I'm about making disciples? I think the number one excuse that I've heard for not making disciples outside of the church is, well, yeah, Kevin, you're the preacher, and you know lots of stuff. I don't know enough. You ever heard that? Like, yeah, I just don't know enough. Uh, seems to me I know less now than I used to. I don't know about you. As you get older in life, you start to realize the more you know, the more you don't know. The reality is, hey, like, none of us knows enough. That's why we need to rely on Jesus Christ. That's why we need to rely on his words. Not to turn away from Jesus and notice, oh, the wind's blowing. Oh, I have my own insecurities. Oh, I have my own fears. Therefore, I don't know if I can do this. Wait, what am I doing out here? No, not taking our eyes off Jesus, but trusting in him. Jesus said to them, what did he say to them? I want you to make disciples. This is how you do it. You're going to be going. You're going to be baptized. You're going to be teaching. But I want you to understand this as well. This is not something you do all by yourself. Behold, I am with you always. This is God's work within us. It's Christ Jesus alive in us. It's whether or not we are willing to stay with Jesus or we get caught up in ourselves. Let his will be done in our lives. Brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus is in you. He's in us. We're not alone on this mission that Jesus has given us. 
Peter and Andrew were casting a net because they were fishermen. They were casting the net into the sea. And Jesus reordered their lives to make them fishers of men. But just like net fishing was not something that a person did all by themselves, you know, you're casting a net into the, the sea. You can't, you, you need more than one person. There needs to be multiple people. In fact, they had partners. You know, Peter and Andrew, they had partners. James and John, they'd have a catch and they'd call their, brother, their partners over. They'd do this together. It's a together thing. Disciple making is not a, a, a lone thing either. Not only do we have Christ working in us, but part of God's design is that we have each other. That we're there for each other. See, we are to be people on a mission. We are to be. A disciple-making mission for Jesus and with Jesus. His power at work in us. So, who can you invite to follow Jesus? In whom are you investing? And specifically, uh, with the, the purpose, the set purpose, the express purpose of bringing them to Christ for them to understand and know and learn about Jesus Christ. It's not up to you alone. Jesus promises to be with us always, not just to comfort and strengthen us, but it's His power at work within us which can save souls. Hey, I don't know enough. Turns out I can't walk on water. But it's not about me, is it? What can happen if it's not about me? What if it's all about Jesus Christ? What is, it, what is possible to happen then? Well, more than we can possibly imagine, right? Things that seem impossible to us are not impossible for God. So I encourage you. Sometimes we get a little bit scared about this command, and yet this is central to who we are as Christians. So I, I encourage you, pray about this. Open up your mind. Recognize how God is going to use you and will use you and wants to use you in this mission of making disciples. Talk about it in your life group. If you're not in a life group, join a life group. In the, in the banner, there's a listing of the various um, uh, emails of those who are leading in life groups. Send them an email. Say, hey, I want to be a part of the group this week. Or if you're not in a life group and you're, and you're not going to join one, talk, at least talk about it with some family, some friends. Talk about how this actually practically plays out in your life, this idea of making disciples. How do you submit your life to God's plan of making disciples? We said from the get-go, if you're a disciple of Christ Jesus, then, well, your mission is to make disciples. It's who we are. And so how does that specifically work out in your life. We see Jesus, he did a lot of things as he was making disciples. He was certainly going about his business, helping people, having compassion on people, teaching people. But he was showing those disciples what it means to be uh, under the will of God, to be following the will of God. He lived day in and day out with them. He showed them, he taught them, he explained things to them. And then he also let them try things out. We, earlier before this, we have a limited commission where they were to go out, they were only going to the, the lost sheep of Israel, people that were like themselves, let's say. But now he's saying, oh, it's not just limited to the people that are like yourself. It's for everybody. And that's your job. That's the mission of the church. That's the mission, mission for me. That's the mission for you. That's the mission for us. As we conclude, won't you pray to God with me? Lord God, we truly do want to be submissive to your will in our lives. We, see, we hear the force with which you make this final command. and We recognize the importance of this. And we are so thankful. We are so thankful that through Jesus Christ you have saved us, that you have redeemed us. And we recognize this is not just for us. This is for, for all who would put their faith in you. But how can people put their faith in you unless they know about you? And so, Lord, help us to be those who, who share your word, who are teachers in whatever capacity that looks like based on who we are as people. 
but help us to be there for each other and help each other to truly be disciple makers of each other so that we can grow in Christ Jesus, but others as well, so that all may come to know you and understand and, and know your love, Lord. We are so grateful for your love. We ask you to bless us as your church. Give us the courage to be who we're meant to be and to submit to your work within our lives. We pray this all in Christ's name. And the congregation said, Amen.